Hi, this is Nick Seifert. This is a practice presentation for uh, uh, CMU's Energy Systems Modeling class in the fall of 2015. And uh, this lecture is on renewable energies. And in particular, we're going to be focusing on concentrated solar thermal and geothermal power plants. OK, so there are a number of different uh, renewable technologies, uh, such as solar thermal, wind, biomass, photovoltaic, geothermal, and hydroelectric. But as I mentioned on the first set of slides, we're going to be focusing on solar thermal and geothermal because they fit in um, best with what we've been covering earlier in this class, which is power plant design. There's no real power plant to be designed for photovoltaic wind. Um, while there is for biomass, um, we, we're not covering combustion of solid fuels in this course. Okay. Um, I do want to point out, though, we'll have a couple of general slides on renewable energy. They're definitely a, a method for um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and um, also um, achieving long-term energy independence. Um, but today's non-hydro renewable energies are highly dependent on a fossil fuel infrastructure, um, and largely because of the intermittency of wind and solar, um, these type of power uh, electricity producers rely on hydro or fossil fuel backup because right now at least electricity storage via batteries is extremely expensive. We will, we will talk about a little bit later how solar thermal can be coupled with um, backup through molten salt storage. Um, but still, uh, which is a little bit cheaper than battery but still um, not um, as we get to the, uh, the next set of lectures, we'll look at capital costs and we'll see the expense of that is, at least right now, not the cheapest electricity source in the U.S. Um, but I do want to point out the potential is there, um, particularly in the southwest for solar uh, and for geothermal, and in the Midwest for wind. There's large potential for, for renewable energy. Um, and right now, at least in the U.S., as of end of 2014, uh, renewable energy is only sitting at about 10% of the total U.S. primary consumption of energy. And about a quarter of that is hydroelectric. Another 50 of that is uh, considered biomass as either wood, biofuels, such as corn ethanol production, um, or biomass waste, uh, such as anaerobic digesters, Running off of municipal solid, um, off of municipal solid wastewater or municipal solid waste uh, power generation, and then another quarter is a roughly wind, uh, geothermal, and solar combined. And um, you see there's solar geothermal, very very small on the scale, but um, we're covering in this course because of the large potential for these, and because we have the techniques that we learned earlier in this course for. Uh, for modeling these type of power plants. So we're going to start first with concentrated solar thermal. So the, the things to note with uh, solar radiation is that um, you can break it apart into what's considered direct light and diffuse light. D direct light consists of radiation that comes straight from the sun without reflecting off of clouds, dust, or the ground. And then diffuse light is that sunlight which does reflect off of clouds or the ground and um, it's really important to differentiate the two because the two um, different types of sunlight can be um, only one of which is useful in solar thermal concentrators and that's direct light um, whereas a photovoltaic the one advantage of photovoltaics is that those can take advantage of both direct and diffuse light because it doesn't require folk at least doesn't require focusing onto a uh, specific target. So then the combination of the two is what's considered global radiation, which is the total um, sunlight hitting the top, top, top of the atmosphere before there's any scattering occurring. Okay. So as I said before, you have solar photovoltaic and solar uh, con concentrating solar power. We're going to be covering CSP in this lectures because uh, these are all coupled to some coupled to a conventional, let's say, Rankine, or maybe a type of piston engine um, power plant that we can model. Um, one thing I want to point out is, uh, depending on where you live, you can look up maps like uh, the one I'm showing you here, put out by uh, NRL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. And uh, th they put out maps like this. I just want to point out um, there's 
couple things to be looking for in these maps uh, when you're wanting to use them to figure out how much sunlight is hitting where you live. Um, the first thing to note is that you want to know is this an annual average or is this a monthly average map? So this one is an annual average. On the next couple slides, I'll be showing you monthly average ones. The other thing is to note that um, these maps are specific to a specific type of technology. Okay. So uh, in this case, uh, this is a specific to a single axis tracking solar collector. Okay. And um, so there's there's zero axis, single axis, and double two axis. And we'll talk about each of those. So what the thing I want to point out is this map, at least, um, where you have this single axis tracking um, averaged over the, o over the entire year. You get areas in the southwest of the US with the values of over 6 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. OK. The next other side I want to show you just you know, um, a, a different set. If you looked only in July and you looked at two axis tracking, that's where your mirror, your mirrors or your collector can move in two different directions. Um, so your collector can move in two, like a dish, we'll talk about dish collectors later. A dish collector um, in July, you can see can actually get greater than nine kilowatt hours per meter squared per day, which makes this, um, you know, it, and what's happening here is that these regions there's very low cloud cover in July, and uh, regions throughout California and Nevada are getting greater than nine kilowatt hours per day. However, we look at the same two axis tracking in December, you see a, a, a very large difference, right? A lots of parts of California, particularly by the a Bay Area where it's cloudy, um, are no longer able to um, get uh, significant amounts of uh, radiation hitting through direct sunlight. Um, but those places in Ca Arizona and New Mexico still can get on the order of four to five, uh, even some parts up to about six kilowatt hours per day per meter squared. Um, where I'm in, in Pittsburgh, you can see we're getting significantly less than two kilowatt hours, meaning you do not want to be building uh, solar thermal collecting power plants in, let's say, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, um, Washington, Alaska. You're just not going to be getting a lot of direct sunlight. Um, speaking of which, I have not seen the sun in a while here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so, okay, so um, typically economics are going to work out if you can get greater than six kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. Uh, direct radiation, um, flat land, and then you obviously want unrestricted, unoccupied land because these solar troughs and, or power towers with heliostats are going to be taking up a large amount of area of land. I do want to point out um, as we go through um, that the exergy in sunlight is not exactly the same as the amount of energy in sunlight. And the difference is about a factor of 95 percent. And the reason is that the temperature of the environment on Earth is about 300 Kelvin. Uh, whereas the temperature in the, uh, of the sunlight coming from the sun is 6,000 Kelvin. And when you plug that into the Carnot efficiency that you put in front of energy to get the exergy, you can see that um, the exergy of sunlight is about 95% of its um, energy content. And also just as a reminder um, that the, we are nowhere near tapping into all the total exergy available in sunlight which is about 162,000 terawatts. Um, you can see from uh, this, this set of slides that we've talked about before in this class from a group at Stanford. Um, we're, we're consuming on the order of 10 to 30 terawatts of um, primary fuel globally. Most of that is coming from coal, oil, and gas. Um, Solar energy is we're not really tapping into maybe on the order of 10 to 100 gigawatts, but the potential is extremely large to be generating a lot of electricity from sunlight. You know, orders and orders and orders of magnitude more um, sunlight could be tapped into than what we're we're going after right now. So now what I want to do is talk a little bit about the different type of solar thermal concentrators. The first one we're going to talk about is the solar trough, shown in the upper left here. 
in which you have a curved mirror, which is um, collecting sunlight um, and reflecting it into a tu uh, absorption tube that is running down the middle. And that's where um, you know, molten salt or water could be flowing through and be heated up. And typical temperatures leaving the trough of, the, of this uh, molten salt or water is between about 350 and 400 degrees Celsius. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is uh, linear Fresnel. Okay, in this case, it's not one large mirror. The mirror is segmented apart, and the mirror is actually placed on the ground, which makes construction of this rather simple. Um, however, you pay a price in the fact that you can't concentrate as much sunlight onto those tubes. A, because it's reflect, um, it's segmented apart, and B, because you know each mirror rather than it wants to be curved but it can only be at a certain angle and each each mirror has is a different angle but um, really what you want to get the most is one mirror that's continuously curved and because of that um, it's less e efficient per meter squared than the trough case you get low uh, you, you're getting the temperature output of your working your, of your molten salt or water is only 280 to 380 degrees Celsius which is less than the trough case, uh, but construction costs per meter squared are going to be less too, so that on average dollars per kilowatt um, you know, are, are somewhat comparable between these two cases. Next one I want to talk about is the solar tower. In this case you have a bunch of mirrors reflecting sunlight into a specific location in which you have a molten salt that can um, be heated up to about 550 to 1000 degrees Celsius. And then finally, we have the dish collectors. And um, here, each dish is, is free to move about two axes to be able to follow the sun uh, across the time of day and time of year. And here, uh, the tea hot, in this case, you're, the sunlight's going to heat um, a fluid, often helium um, or, or a hydrogen, in which um, it's going into working on a, what's called a Stirling cycle and uh, T hot on that Stirling cycle is between 1000 to 3000 degrees Celsius and that Stirling cycle, each dish has its own Stirling cycle um, whereas in the other three cases you're just heating a fluid and that fluid goes to a cent is collected in, and there'd be one large like ranking cycle power plant and we'll talk about that shortly so we're going to go through uh, a little bit more detail in each of each of those again. So the linear Fresnel, um, think of as a very very limited uh, degrees of freedom. It can the mirrors can very slightly change um, acro across time on day. So it, it, you kind of call this between a zero and one degree of tracking. Um, and uh, they are mounted on the ground, which makes ca you know installation costs low. Uh, but you're generating electri less electricity because you just can't collect as much um, sunlight through this tube, so that the temperature coming out is is less than for any of the other systems talked about. Okay, this, the next one, parabolic, parabolic trough. This is a true uh, one-axis tracking system meaning that um, let's say you were to al align the the tubes so the tubes kind of ran in a north-south direction then the trough would rotate during the time of day so as the sun goes from the east to the west of course the sun doesn't go perfectly from the east to west you know um, across the time of the year it change, that angle changes but once you build this you can't change the angle of it so what it means is that these trough systems you design them to be um, get the maximum efficiency at whatever time you want you think you need the electricity the most um, so maybe you design it to be optimal in July or maybe optimal in March or maybe in December uh, that, and um, but uh, this is a one, what's considered a one tracking system and um, pictured here is a 64 megawatt system in Nevada that went online in June 2007. Here's, here's the process flow diagram for this system and I um, want to point out some of the main things here. 
We're going to have uh, oil flowing. Uh, during the day, the oil is going to be going through the parabolic troughs, getting heated up. And then there's going to be a splitter right here during the day. Some of the oil is going to go in this direction, and it's going to go to heating the ranking cycle water. So it'd be going through here. We got superheater, steam generator, uh, reheater. Okay, so in the day we have some going this direction. We have some being split in this direction, go through a counter flow heat exchanger. And in that case, what's happening is we have some molten salt that is going counter flow from cold tank to the warm tank as the hot oil goes through and loses some of its heat and then mixes with the cold oil that went through the ranking cycle and then gets reheated in the trough. During uh, At night, what happens is um, as this oil, now the oil, instead of going through the, these troughs, the oil goes up in this direction. It's going up through this counterflow heat exchanger. And the molten salt is going now flowing in the opposite direction from the hot tank to the cold tank. And still we have, now what this allows us to do is we can still generate some electricity at night because the molten salt is storing thermal energy. A couple other things I want to point about the system. Uh, main thing, I just want to point out some main um, items that are showing up on this process flow diagram. After the superheater, we're going into the high pressure turbine. Uh, and then that liquid coming out of the high pressure turbine is going to reheat. And then it goes back into the low, low pressure turbine. And then this low pressure turbine actually has three stages it's draw, uh, at which water uh, steam is being drawn. So after the first stage, we have some uh, steam being drawn and sent to a open feed water heater labeled the deaerator. After the second stage, we have some steam being sent to the closed feed water heater labeled here as the low pressure preheater. And then finally, we have some, after the third stage of the LP turbine, uh, that steam goes to a condenser and then that liquid is combined with the liquid from the uh, closed feed water heater pumped up to the pressure of the deaerator and then it mixed you know, with that liquid and then pumped up again um, so the liquid can go through the steam generator. Uh, note the this deaerator is acting both as a deaerator and an open feed water heater and the point here is that um, at the top of here, any gases, any vapors, uh, what's called non-water vapors, such as nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon, that could get slip into the system if there's cracks, that's where uh, these gases are removed so they don't build up in the system. Here on this slide, I just want to show you that any real system is actually a lot more complicated than what was shown. There's often multiple closed feed water heaters. In this case, there's actually really five closed feed water heaters that are being modeled, one op open feed water heater. And uh, because of that, you, you often have multiple places in which you're drawing from the in between the turbine blades uh, in both the high and low pressure turbine. The next topic we're going to be covering is uh, the solar power tower. In this case, we have a field of heliostats, the mirrors, which are focusing on the power tower. Um, in which a molten salt would be heated and then that uh, molten salt would transfer its energy to um, the ranking cycle. And um, because we have, the reason you can get to quite high temperatures here is that an entire field is focusing its sunlight into one location. So this is why you can get a lot higher um, temperatures than you can for the trough, trough and particularly above the you know higher temperatures in the linear Fresnel. And um, this, this system, um, while it looks like the mirrors have two degrees of freedom, you have to remember that they need to focus onto one spot, which really makes this a single axis tracking system. Right? You always have to reflect um, onto a single point, which you don't have to do in the dish, which is where we'll see the dish is what's considered a true two axis tracking. Okay, so the process flow diagrams for solar towers. Um, you can either have pure ranking cycle, like what's shown on the top. You've got a molten salt going through. Perhaps you have a duct burner to heat it up even more. 
and that molten salt is then going in a counterflow direction and heating up steam into for a ranking cycle. Okay. You could also, um, instead of having a molten salt, you could have air as your working fluid going through the solar tower. And in that case, you'd have um, a Brayton cycle where you compress, send through, maybe have a duct burner with natural gas, um, and then you go through the, the, tur the turbine and then the counterflow heat exchange in this direction to your ranking cycle. Finally, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about DISH CSP. This is a two-axis solar. Um, this is a true two-axis solar um, tracking field, and uh, these are can yield the highest uh, temperatures, uh, and they end up sending the sunlight to heat up um, either hydrogen or helium um, in a Stirling engine. Um, it, the advantage is, is that uh, uneven land is okay and no water requirement. However, these are not amenable to solar thermal, which means they're not amenable to nighttime power. It's just one disadvantage with them. Um, they often are, are getting the highest sunlight to el electricity to sunlight efficiencies. For example, in 2008, a record was broken by uh, Sandia and Sterling Engine S Energy Systems. They set a record of 31.25 uh, efficiency. Uh, that beat out a previous record from 1984. I did look up about the 2015 record now is sitting around 34% at commercial scale. Um, lab scale photovoltaic systems are sitting about 40%. But we're still quite far away from the uh, hypothetical maximum which would be 95%. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that record was made on a very cold bright day. The reason cold is really crucial for these dish Stirling um, engine systems is that, you know, the Carnot cycle, really there's two things, right? It's the temperature at which you can get the hot fluid, but it's also dependent on the temperature at which you can exhaust thermal waste thermal energy to the environment. And you want that temperature as low as possible to get the highest Carnot efficiency. So that's why on a cold, bright day where you don't have clouds, is when you can get the highest efficiency from these systems. So just as a reminder, uh, from hottest to coldest, as far as the working fluid temperature you can get, the dish, the two tracking system dish systems were the highest, followed by the single axis tracking power tower, then parabolic trough, and then the linear Fresnel, which is almost zero um, between, I'll call it between zero and one axis tracking. Uh, I do want to point out that um, solar can be integrated quite well with fossil fuels as we showed in the solar tower case. Often you have duct burners which would be running on natural gas, but you could imagine um, retrofitting a coal fire power plant or a natural gas combined cycle power plant with solar energy. And uh, the nice thing is that um, what it does is it avoids inefficiencies is ramping up and down. Um, you know, if you're only working during the day, at night, you know, you can be running on natural gas to still be generating electricity uh, without needing molten salt storage. And then finally, I just want to show, I, I like this graph a lot because it shows uh, direct normal insulation, right? So direct sunlight across the U.S. Th so this would be places where you could build solar thermal collectors. And um, so well, you can see the main places around the world where solar thermal would be of interest would be the southwest um, U.S. and uh, west of Mexico. Um, you've got Chile in South America. Then you've got the Sahara in northern Africa and then also large parts of South Africa. The, almost the entire Middle East, this could be used, as well as parts of Pakistan, Afghanistan and west, northwestern India, and but particularly one of the best places is Australia. So now we're going to change topics and we're going to be talking about geothermal power plants. Here's a map uh, in the US. Uh, note here the units are milliwatts per meter squared right, because um, this is a continuous uh, amount of energy that's coming up per meter squared. and um, Note that um, in, in the U.S. at least, it's the West Coast that has a lot of geothermal um, 
um, energy that's available. Part of that's coming from um, plate tectonics, let's say around um, around the San Andreas Fault on the west uh, in west side of California. But you can see also one of the major places, is the hot, the largest hot spot in all of uh, the U.S. is uh, north. Uh, West Wyoming, uh, close to Idaho and Montana, which is the Yellowstone region, where there's a lot of geothermal um, um, geothermal resources available. As far as the East Coast, you see some locations in West Virginia uh, that that uh, could be potentially uh, accessed. Okay, so where is this heat coming from, right? The neat thing about it is um, part of its heat that it was initially present during the Earth's formation that is just slowly leaking its way out, but also some of it is actually from ni natural isotopic decay of um, large elements, which ties in, interestingly, to what we were talking about last set of lectures, which was nuclear fission. And um, so the what's happening is that rainwater or other water is seeping down into reservoirs where there may be faults that it the water can get down to close to where there would be maybe magma heating the water and then be maybe another fault uh, line in, in which that water can work its way back up. Uh, so it, since it de depends greatly on the location of you know, either plate tectonics, magma, or faults, geothermal use depends greatly on where you're located which because of that, because the ground temperature and the ground itself uh, varies greatly. So um, I do want to point out that um, there are some general classifications for geothermal reservoirs. If they're less than 150 degrees Celsius, they're considered low temperature. If they're above 150 degrees Celsius, they're considered high temperature. And it's the high temperature ones that are really being actively sought out for. And um, so examples of some of these places in the U.S. would be the Geyser region in Northern California, just north of San Francisco Bay Area, uh, the Imperial Valley in South Carolina, uh, in South uh, Southern California, and then in particular the Yellowstone region of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. Here are just a couple. I'm not a geologist, so I don't want to get um, too much into the detail here, um, but I just want to particularly show in the top right case where you could have rainwater working its way down a fault, go through a permeable sandstone, get heated up um, by, let's say, convecting magma, and then if there's another fault line, that water could work its way back up in the form of a spring or a geyser. Maybe it could only work part of the way up, and then you'd have to drill down to uh, access it. Okay. As far as power plants go, which is what we're interested in most in this class, um, you can break geothermal into three main types of power plants. The earliest built were called dry steam because you are directly accessing steam, no liquid, um, so the temperature is high enough and or the pressure is low enough that you already just have steam and you don't have to do anything. Uh, you can just run that through a turbine. Second is either when the pressures are higher or the temperatures are lower, you have what's called flash steam. In that case, we'll see we're going to need to flash off the steam, leaves us some liquid, and um, that steam would then go through the ranking, uh, would go through a um, steam, uh, steam turbine. Okay, in the third case, the working fluid never contacts the working fluid. Okay, the working fluid never contacts the uh, geothermal uh, resource. And that's typically done when you have temperatures below 150 degrees C, in which flashing just doesn't really make much sense. You're not going to be getting much, um, you, can, you can't get much pressure out um, from flashing. Uh, in that case, your working fluid um, it goes through a heat exchanger with, on the other side is the hot geothermal brine. And typically, uh, production wells, sometimes you don't have to drill that far, sometimes you have to go down fairly far, and also the other thing to note is sometimes the pressure of the fluid um, is high enough that you can, that will naturally flow to the surface, and other times you actually have to spend some energy to pump it to the surface. So the first ones we're going to talk about, there's dry steam, which really were the first ones being uh, built. Uh, these are the geysers in Northern California, or Yellowstone as well as um, in Italy and Japan, there were 
these dry steams that were uh, dry steam power plants were built. And uh, here's what the process flow diagram looks like for these systems. In this case, you have steam going from your production well right into your turbine, generating electricity. And then you have a condenser because you're pulling vacuum here. So to get the most amount of energy out from the turbine, you're pulling vacuum. And then you need, so to create the liquid from the vapor, you need a cooling tower. And, uh, and then you need to pump that liquid back up to at least atmospheric pressure and then send that to the injection well and then some of that liquid is actually going to go to your cooling tower and evaporate up. Which is why it's often easy to see geothermal power plants because you have massive amount of water vapor leaving cooling towers. Uh, water vapor turning into um, water droplets which is what you see. And now the next case is going to be flash and um, this is typically when you have you still need fairly high temperatures um, but if you also have high pressure where the brine is in dropped in the, you drop the pressure in a tank so um, that's what we mean by flashing some of the liquid goes into the vapor phase which is endothermic cooling the temperature of the liquid but generating some steam um, often these type of power plants have multiple flash tanks at different pressures. Maybe you, you go from 7 bar to, to 4 bar to 1 bar, you know, those kind of order of magnitudes. Um, whether it be each stage you're pulling off a little bit of, um, pulling off a little bit of vapor and the temperature slash pressure which you're pulling it from starts dropping as you go down those flash tanks. Okay, so here's what the process flow diagram looks like. You have your production well, flash tank that produces some of the water turns into steam, goes through a steam turbine, and then the, you need that condenser because um, there's going to be, once again, vacuum here to get the most energy out. Um, you pump it back up to atmospheric pressures. Some of that goes to the cooling tower. Some of that can go to um, direct heat um, use at your home. And then the rest gets re-injected back into the reservoir to make sure the reservoir doesn't um, lose, um, lose water. Okay, and then finally we have the binary ones. And this is typically when um, you're at 182 degrees C or less. Um, there's a lot of different solvents that are used out there. One example would be isobutane. Uh, it has a lower boiling temperature, which is why it's uh, quite useful. And uh, so in this case, our working fluid is isobutane, not water vapor. Um, the, the geothermal brine never comes in direct contact with that isobutane. So it's a, this is a essentially closed loop, which means zero emissions. And um, so th there's a case, um, binary geothermal power plants in um, Mammoth, California, as well as I know some in Idaho. And uh, these plants are becoming more and more common since most resources that are left are lower and lower in temperatures. Um, but because we're talking about lower temperature, we're, we're getting less and less actual electricity out per kilowatt hour of thermal enthalpy. So here's what the process flow diagram looks like. You have a production well, might have a pump if you need the pressure. Um, so then that hot geothermal brine goes into the counterflow heat exchanger and then goes, is directed um, back, is injected back into the reservoir. So here our solvent, maybe isobutane, goes through, gets turned into a vapor, goes through the turbine, is condensed, and then goes through a pump, and you just repeat around in the cycle. Uh, in this case, maybe you have air as you're just cooling, just cooling fans. You see not a cooling tower, there's, um, unless you have water that you can use for makeup and um, so this is the binary uh, cycle. And finally to conclude and then to, to transition to the next set of lectures which will be capital cost estimating, just want to show you one slide that I'll be presenting then which is the levelized cost of electricity as calculated in June 2015 by the EI, US uh, Energy Information AI. And I um, just want to show you how some of these uh, renewable energies that we've been talking about compete against some other um, fossil fuel and other renewable systems as far as their total 
localized cost of electricity, which is shown in the column almost to the right, which is total system LCOE, which is a sum of all um, all the four terms in front of that. Localized capital cost, fixed operating and maintenance, variable operating and maintenance, which is including fuel, and then uh, if they think there needs to be a transmission uh, investment. And then finally on the right they have, uh, they look at some subsidies which are available as of now. Um, and so they subtract those subsidies off and then show a total LCOE that includes the, the subsidy. Um, the key things I want to note is in this uh, study which looks at, was done, um, were published in 2015 for resources being built by 2020. The lowest cost um, is geothermal. So right now we don't have a lot of geothermal but um, in the U.S. proportionally, but you can see LCOE is uh, the lowest of any of the ones studied. Uh, now of course that depends on where you are, right? you can't just build it anywhere, but of those places that they looked at, uh, and feel free to go to the uh, website linked up below, which also um, th they show you on one of the other slides and that um, the min and max, this is just the averaged values across um, the places that they looked. Well, geothermal is coming out uh, as the lowest LCOE, which is uh, quite important. And, in, and it is a dispatchable technology. You notice top ones are all ones that are dispatchable, bottom are non-dispatchable. So um, if you see it down the bottom, solar thermal, that is, not uh, that is a solar thermal that does not have molten salt storage. They don't have a, um, they have not yet, um, well, I've not seen up here solar thermal with um, solar management, which would then become a dispatchable technology. Um, you can see solar thermal is not doing all too well. It's actually the highest, um, which is um, at least interesting. The highest even with the subsidies. Um, you can see that they're higher, coming in higher than solar photovoltaic, um, which is you know sitting at the orders of about $100 per megawatt hour, um, which is about the same order of magnitude as other type of um, biomass, um, advanced nuclear is sitting around uh, that region, traditional coal. Uh, the one, the after, the other um, low ones, at least right now, are um, natural gas combined cycle power plants sitting at around seventy-five dollars per megawatt hour, and onshore wind, which is also sitting around seventy-four dollars per megawatt hour. So I just want to show you, you know, in conclusion, this is going to be our transition to the next set of topics, which is capital cost estimating, and just to show you where some of the technologies we've looked at in this set of lectures fits against some of the other ones, at least in the U.S. You know, it's going to depend on which country you're in, but here we see geothermal is actually quite um, a low LCOE, solar thermal is at least sitting uh, quite high, but in specific locations, um, that actually that number can drop into the 100s. Uh, this is an averaged over um, over those places they looked at. Okay, so thanks for listening, and uh, have a good day.